Okay. So tonight there was a special request recently for a bit of a compassion meditation and a theme theme compassion. And so uh, I think tonight will be uh, the the topic will be compassion instead of um, our usual metta, which is fairly close. The Buddha um, used both terms uh, in in many different ways and uh, meaning almost the same thing sometimes. But uh, we'll just start with a half an hour sit and that will be guided compassion meditation. And um, also because the Buddha, uh, there is this, um, these four Brahma Viharas, uh, Metta, Karuna, Compassion, uh, Mudita, Joy, and Upeka, Calm, or Equanimity. Uh, they can be in an order, but they can also, and they also should be practiced if someone wants to develop in different wholesome states. They can be uh, practiced, uh, each of them, from the first jhana to, well, depending which one we're talking about, but uh, the fourth or the fourth jhana or higher. And uh, this is, in fact, some uh, instructions that the Buddha gave. And so tonight we'll be touching simply a little bit more on the compassion side. And then um, I'll be explaining a little bit more about uh, wisdom and compassion together, because that is a big theme in the Buddha's teaching. And how how it is why do we always hear about these two things coming together wisdom and compassion in the buddhist teaching and uh, they they are very closely related in fact uh, wisdom comes uh, naturally with compassion as a result and uh, we'll explore that a little a little more and so Beginning with this meditation, you can simply, as usual, take a comfortable position. A position in which you feel at ease, that your body isn't bothering you too much. And simply take a few moments, take a few moments together to just let go, viveka, of everything that was happening before this, whatever you were doing before or whatever you're projecting for after this talk or little session here. Simply let it all go. Relax. And smile. Notice how good it feels to just let it all go. All the tensions that might pull us outwardly. Having to do this or that, or wanting to do this or that. If we simply take a step back and detach we notice right there, there is relief.
and the Buddha said and this piti jayati and then joy arises bliss arises Notice if there's any tension in your body. And let it go. This meditation is based upon, it is founded upon letting go, release, relaxing. Vosagaramana Making this relaxation in fact our object of meditation. And letting go doesn't happen all at once. There are tensions that take time to let go, to open. But as long as we keep the direction, we keep to the right effort, the wise practice, they will be falling away. And the mind settles and becomes very happy, collected inwardly. Now perhaps there is someone around you in your life that is close to you that you care about, that is having some hard time. Or perhaps it's a situation you're going through. Or perhaps it's even more than one person.
simply allow your heart to receive the situation as it is to see perhaps that person or that situation that is unpleasant or troublesome to you allow it to fully take place not pushing it away that's what it means and to welcome it with love and compassion this feeling that is very close to the love that we are practicing usually this tender glowing feeling in the center of your chest running its course through your whole body them to be happy wish them safety and well-being even if that person has abused you whether from acts of body or acts of speech or acts of mind Perhaps using a word like I forgive you. and letting go of any tension that could arise from bringing up that situation or person in your heart not holding a grudge welcoming them with a heart filled with compassion perhaps even saying like me I know you want to be happy. May you be happy. The truth is all living creatures, all living beings just want to be happy. And 
to understand this and that everybody wants to be happy. This is called discernment. Not getting lost in the mud of our own personal gains and happiness but to develop universal unconditional compassion Compassion is the same feeling as love, but when things get rough, when things don't really go your own way, it is very close to forgiveness. It is taking a step further from the love and practicing it when we see other people suffering, having a hard time. And we develop this truly marvelous quality of empathy And the Buddha's teaching is, of, of course, not limited to only one person, one situation. The Buddha's way of teaching the Brahma Viharas was always with the component that it had to be completely open for all living beings in all directions sabbhavanta loke in this boundless universe perhaps bringing to mind the question have you ever seen someone who was completely perfectly happy all the time every day with nothing to work on very very rare The truth is we all have our own little things that we need to work on. Everybody has their own hurt unless they're fully awakened.
and to seeing this in all living beings that nobody is perfect except those who are fully awakened we can have a lot of compassion for all living beings in all of space in this boundless universe And relax, don't get too involved. Don't build tension. Simply let go into this cradle of compassion. upholding the universe starting from your heart And this is especially true for all living beings that haven't come upon this teaching. That are wandering in the dark, not knowing about the virtues, not knowing about the goodness of generosity. that all actions have their result in the law of cause and effect. Beings that do not know the difference between wholesome and unwholesome states and their direct correlation with happiness. Beings who are still in the mud of lying, stealing, cheating, or even perhaps killing, not understanding that they are causing themselves great trouble.
simply by not knowing. Sending them all of our compassion. To all living beings in this particular time where there is a lot of anxiety, high levels of stress and mental unrest. not pushing it away, allowing it to be there and welcoming it with love and compassion. Suki no wa ke mi no huntu. May all beings be happy and secure. Sabe satta sabe panna sabe bhuta sabe bhukana Sabe atabhava pariya panna Sabe itiyo sabe purisa Sabe ariya sabe anariya Sabe Deva Sabe Manusa Sabe Vini Patika Awe Rauntu Abhyapa Jauntu Awe Rauntu Sukhiyata Nang Pariyarantu Dukha muchantu yatalada sampatito mawi gachantu kamasaka Purati maya disaya pechi maya disaya Utaraya disaya dakinaya disaya Purati maya nudisaya pechi maya nudisaya Uttaraya nudisaya, dakinaya nudisaya. Sabe satta, sabe panna, sabe bhuta, sabe pukala. Sabe atabhava pariyapanna. Sabe tiyo, sabe purisa. Sabe Ariya, Sabe Anariya. 
sabbe dewa sabbe manusa sabbe wini patika Ahuera untu abya peja untu Aniga untu sukyatanang pariyarantu Dukkamuchantu yathalada sampatito Mawinga chantu kamasaka Imaya dhamma nu dhamma pati pati ya buddhang pujemi Imaya dhamma nu dhamma pati pati ya dhammang pujemi Imaya dhamma nu dhamma pati pati ya sanghang pujemi Adhai maya pati padaya jati jara jimpyadi maranangha parimuchi sami Idang me punyang asawa kayang waham hotu. Idang me punyang nibhan asa pachayo hotu. Nama punya bagang sabasatanang bajimi. Te sabhe me samang punya bagang labantu sad sa. And slowly, at your own pace, you can incline your mind to listening to the Dhamma. And this chant is simply a chant that says, uh, May all living beings, breathing things, all creatures, all creepy crawlies, all devas and humans, all those who are aryas, and those who are not. May they all be free from ill will, hatred. May they be free from anger. May they come upon goodness and happiness. To the north, the south, the east, the west, and all the intervals, and by our own practice in accordance with the Dhamma. This is how we pay true homage to the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. And the end is a dedication of merit or goodness that we have developed. And uh, we, in the Buddha's teaching, much emphasis is put on generosity. And so whenever we do good things, we share the result of our actions with all living beings for their happiness and welfare and well-being. And that is the, the true meaning of sharing merits, is in developing a generous mind with all of our actions. Even if it is not material, in fact, it doesn't mean that we can't share it. <laughs> and this, these good actions that we do, whether they're from body, speech, or mind, we share the result of this karma or we put the intention of sharing it with everybody. And to use these, this goodness and these merits to uh, experience Nibbana, experience the, the may do the, ex have the experience of Nibbana. And this is the sutta tonight, Nibbana Sukha Sutta, the Nibbana is happiness. And um, so to link a little bit 
wisdom and compassion together as I said earlier well we need to understand that uh, what the Buddha's teaching is and what the Buddha's awakening was also and if we go to the core his awakening was uh, about the four awakened understandings the four noble truths and this means to see what is troublesome what is hurtful what is unwholesome and that is causing us problems to see it and to know its cause because to understand really what it is we un we need to understand its cause and but the, it doesn't stop there fortunately the most important part of the practice is to in fact let it go <laughs> and this is where this um, chaga patinisaga mutti analaya comes in this giving it up giving up what is troublesome what is causing us hurt that can take many 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 forms but uh, to break free from it patinisaga mutti freedom and uh, analaya not clinging to it letting it go and the fourth awakened understanding or noble truth is the eightfold path the eight spoke path and the four noble truths are within the eightfold path the eightfold path is within the four noble truths and so these two things are very core uh, aspects of the the buddha's teaching and his awakening but to make a long story short this first noble truth really what the buddha realized that bodhi that awakening was that this this trouble this hurt whatever form or shape or name we give it it has three roots greed hate and delusion and this is the cause of all of our problems <laughs> there is even a very good sutta in the Samyutta Nikaya Chanda the furious comes to the Buddha and asks so Bhante what makes how does his one known to be furious and or angry and how is one known to be gentle the Buddha skillfully replies when one has not abandoned greed other people irritate him therefore he shows irritation and anger he is known as furious one has not abandoned anger or dislike therefore other people irritate him or her and that person shows irritation and anger that person is known as furious one has not abandoned delusion delusion here is many things but is lacking discernment and not knowing the wholesome and the unwholesome really in short that's what it means and other people irritate him or her and that person shows irritation that person is known as furious and the gentle is well a person has abandoned greed a person has abandoned anger a person has abandoned delusion and other people's other people do not irritate them <laughs> because when we are free from greed hate and delusion we're just happy others do not affect us so much <laughs> why because there is no greed, because there is no hate, because there is no delusion. The mind is free. It, it is not um, 
heavied down by these states and confused and obsessed and overwhelmed. And when the mind moves away from this, it moves towards inevitably something wholesome. It moves towards happiness and joy. And this is why this sutta tonight on Nibbana Sukha and uh, when we have this discernment that is the key thing here discernment is also uh, wisdom panya and for a person who knows the Buddha's teaching, for example, knows and practices the Four Noble Truths, knows and practices the Eightfold Path, inevitably, at one point or another, by their own mental progress, their own mental development, there will be a lot of happiness because that is simply what happens when we hold the virtue. When we abandon impatience, jealousy, anger, uh, strong desires for things, obsessive desires, attachments, when we let these things go, and pride, arrogance, then we notice that the mind is very happy and it's very uplifted, naturally. And that's the Buddha's teaching, in short. But the thing is, why is this wisdom and compassion come together so much in the Buddha's teaching? Well, because when we start becoming established firmly in the Buddha's teaching, and we see others that are not, that do not understand karma, that do not understand the causality of reality, the things that we do come back to us. Therefore, when we're generous, many things come to us. We're opening up, we're not stingy, we're not holding on to what we have. And then, perhaps it seems like a compromise at first, but then in fact, and the Buddha praised generosity in so many ways, and to give, just to give. If people knew, as he did, that's what he said, the importance of generosity and the power of generosity, people would never eat a single meal without sharing it. They would not use anything without sharing it first. And why? Because... In one sutta, he explains that even something that is given to an animal comes back a hundred times to us. And that is uh, not counting to a, a human being, which comes back to us thousands and thousands of times. Now this, I'm not going to get too deep into that tonight, but this is in relation to uh, someone's wisdom and someone's goodness also uh, someone who is content who uh, receives a whole a whole lot of money for example and well that person is simply content what else could happen with that money that person doesn't need anything so that money is just going to go somewhere else to a good cause <laughs> so uh, then that's an example with money, but that's with everything. The Buddha said the, the Sangha is like this greedless field. Anything that is given to them is planted in a field without weeds, because he said weeds are bane of fields. Greed is the bane of humankind. Weeds are the bane of fields, and hate is the bane of humankind. And those people who practice to give up greed and hate, they become this unsurpassed field of goodness to plant the seeds in. 
because whoever practices the Buddha's teaching means that they're practicing generosity, they're practicing the virtue, not killing, not lying, not stealing. This is quite powerful protection in many ways, and in ways that we sometimes don't even comprehend. And when things are given to support that in any kind of way, it bears tremendous fruits. Because it goes a long way, nobody wants it, really. Everybody's happy, so we can help more people. <laughs> That's just how it works. There's just this willingness of doing more generosity because there's happiness within that. That's where the happiness comes from. Therefore, there's no, there's no caring about, oh, my next uh, thing that I'm going to do or like... Uh, my next car or something like that. <laughs> it's like, uh, there's none of that. That's it's fine. There's only using what the requisites that are needed for life and then being okay with that. And in fact, there is great joy in not taking so much and living lightly. Very, very joyful state to be. And when we see or when someone who practices in that way sees another person who is still lost, who is still not understood that by lying, cheating, stealing, all these things, that person is actually not helping themselves. And great, great compassion arises. And with the Buddha's teaching, that's the thing that happens, is that the deeper we go into this wonderful teaching, the more wisdom we develop, discerning what is wholesome and what is unwholesome. We start seeing that in others, when people are hurting themselves, for example, because they don't know. They don't know that this anger is not helping them. They don't know that losing their mind and obsessing about this or that is actually here and now hell. <laughs> it is not mental peace. It is not Nibbana. Nibbana here is, that's the other thing that will be discussed tonight, is Nibbana, the definition of Nibbana, simply means blowing out the cooling down, the quenching. That's simply what Nibbana means. And it's used in many ways in the suttas. And to put down, put out the fire of greed and selfishness and hate and dislike and judging and opinions. All these unwholesome, unskillful states that are in fact causing us so much problems. And the deeper we go, the deeper we have insight into reality directly. And when we see others going into these states and indulging in them, we feel great compassion. We feel great compassion and feel, feel what they're experiencing. But that is the difference with compassion here, is that it needs also wisdom. It needs that detachment, because otherwise we start ourselves sinking in the mud. Therefore, compassion needs this solid ground of wisdom. And that is this Atta Deepa, Atta Sarana, the Buddha called, to make ourselves as islands, as refuges, to have our own selves as the island, to make the Dhamma our island, to make the Dhamma our refuge. And from that solid ground of wisdom, then we can help others. We can lend a hand or something. 
and we can resonate with what they're living. And that is how it works. And that is how wisdom and compassion support each other. And really, there's so much more to say about this. But um, when someone is drowning in the flood, that person cannot help another. One needs to be on solid ground. And that is the difference with compassion. That's what differentiates the love and the compassion. The love is good and everything is good. Everybody's happy. We all want to share this goodwill, this love for all living beings. But that compassion is when there's that problem component, the difficulty component, where we see other people having a hard time or having a hard time ourselves. And that's why in Pali, the other word for compassion is anukampi, the verb anukampati. Kampa means to tremble. And so this is this trembling, this resonating for, uh, with others, that empathy. But without losing our mental stability. So therefore we need the wisdom also. We need that solid ground. And how this is the topic of tonight's talk, and how Nibbana and this whole path of the Buddha's teaching, especially in meditation, is happiness. And that is the happiness that the Buddha taught and praised and encouraged people to indulge in. <laughs> because um, there is great happiness in the Buddha's teaching, simply. Um, we need to know a little bit more about what the Buddha taught sometimes. And so here, this is a Nibbana as happiness, and the Venerable, this is Venerable Sariputta, the right hand uh, chief disciple of the Buddha. Uh, and he says, uh, Nibbana is blissful, friends, Nibbana is blissful. When this was said, the Venerable Udayi said, What is the reason, friend Sariputta, why it is said to be blissful when there is nothing to be felt there? Which is a pretty good question. <laughs> because as it is uh, very often uh, conceptualized or understood, Nibbana is this end goal, the ultimate uh, goal of the Buddha's teaching. And it is. Its synonym are viraga and niroda. Niroda is that cessation where at the end of the path there is that complete breaking free even from awareness. And viraga, which is calming down, being uh, unshakable, uh, not being agitated. And so this calming down, this uh, bringing things to their end and this ex uh, blowing out, the quenching, Nibbana, they come together as, as synonyms, usually. And the Venerable Udayi here is asking a pretty good question, whereas uh, how, how can this be happiness when there's actually nothing to be felt there? Maybe not, uh, this is a question lacking a little bit of direct experience, probably. <laughs> but um, here we will go onwards. That is exactly why it is blissful, friend, because there is nothing to be felt. <laughs> there are these five kinds of sensory gratifications, friend. What five? Forms perceived by the eye which are desired, loved, seductive and enticing, mingled with desire and exciting. Sounds perceived by the ear which are desired and loved, 
odors perceived by the nose, flavors perceived by the tongue, tangibles perceived by the body, which are desired and loved, seductive and enticing, mingled with desire and exciting. Friend, the happiness and enjoyment that arises because of these five ways of indulging into the senses, this is called the happiness of craving or the happiness of sensory gratification. And the Buddha said, in fact, that these gratification in the five senses is the ground also for these three unwholesome roots to arise. And that is why it is so important and it comes back so many times in the Buddha's teaching. And that is very important for us to understand that that is at the root of what is called discernment, at the root of Panya is to understand that these five, also they're called the, the cords of sensual pleasures, all these, these five doors of the senses, the pleasure and uh, enjoyment that arises from them is a poor investment. <laughs> and it is happiness invested on very, very shaky grounds which can be taken away at any time and can end into some problems. And the Buddha here, I will just step aside of this sutta and go to the Potaliya Sutta where the Buddha gave these brilliant similes for these uh, sense uh, gratification pleasures. And they are very well known to the monks but also to the people that practice this teaching and I will introduce them <laughs> with the sutta. Suppose a dog overcome by hunger and weakness was waiting by a butcher's shop. Then a skilled butcher or his apprentice would toss the dog a well-hacked, clean-hacked skeleton of meatless bones smeared with blood. What do you think, householder? Would that dog get rid of his hunger and weakness by gnawing such, such a well-hacked, clean-hacked skeleton of meatless bones smeared with blood? No, venerable sir, why is that? Because that skeleton is well-hacked, cleanly hacked, meatless meatless bones smeared with blood, eventually that dog would reap weariness and disappointment. So too, householder, a noble disciple considers thus, sensual pleasures have been compared to a skeleton by the Blessed One. They provide much suffering and much despair, while the danger in them is great. Having seen this, Thus, as it actually is with proper wisdom, one avoids the equanimity that is diversified, based on diversity, and develops the equanimity that is unified, based on unity. Where clinging to the material things of the world utterly ceases without remainder. And this equanimity that is based on diversity is what happens when we only indulge in the five senses and that is simply another way of talking about really coarse dullness of mind which leads to indifference because these sense pleasures are simply a bottomless pit when we start indulging in them there is only more that we want to fulfill the gap again. And truly, the Buddha said, this is simply happening because people do not know the happiness of wholesome states. They do not see the danger in, in seeking happiness in these things. 
Householder, suppose a vulture, a heron, or a hawk seized a piece of meat and flew away, and then vultures, herons, and hawks pursued it and pecked and clawed it. What do you think, householder, if that vulture, heron, or hawk does not quickly let go of that piece of meat, wouldn't it incur death or deadly suffering because of that? Yes, venerable sir, so too, householder, a noble disciple considers thus. Sensual pleasures have been compared to a piece of meat by the Blessed One. They provide much suffering and much despair, while the danger in them is, is great. Having seen this thus as it actually is with proper wisdom, one avoids the equanimity that is diversified, based on diversity, and develops the equanimity that is unified, based on unity. Where clinging to the material things of the world utterly ceases without reminder. Now, this simply means when we cultivate this mental development, this mental steadiness, this upeka, this equanimity that is based on mental development with meditation, as the Buddha taught, which is based on joy mainly, but the joy of letting go, the joy of detaching, the joy of relaxing, and the joy of samadhi, there's lots of joy in this equanimity based on unity. That is samadhi here. That is what the Buddha is saying. Householder, suppose a man took a blazing grass torch and went against the wind. What do you think, householder, if that man does not quickly let go of that blazing grass torch. Wouldn't that torch burn his hand or his arm or some other part of his body so that he might incur death or deadly suffering because of that? Yes, venerable sir. So too, householder, noble disciple, considers sensual pleasures have been compared to a grass torched by the Blessed One. Householder, suppose there were a charcoal pit deeper than a man's height, full of glowing coals, without flame or smoke. Then a man came who wanted to live and not to die, who wanted pleasure and recoiled from pain. And two strong men seized him by both arms and dragged him towards that charcoal pit. What do you think, householder? What? Would that man twist his body this way or that way? Yes, venerable sir, why is that? Because that man knows that if he falls in that charcoal pit, he will incur death or deadly suffering. So too, householder, the noble, a noble disciple considers thus sensual pleasures have been compared to a charcoal pit by the Blessed One. They provide much suffering and much despair, while the danger is them is greater. Householder, suppose a man dreamt about lovely parks, lovely groves, lovely meadows, and lovely lakes, and on waking up saw nothing of it. So too, householder, a noble disciple considers thus, sensual pleasures have been compared to a dream by the Blessed One. They provide much suffering and much despair, while the danger in them is still greater. Householder, suppose a man borrowed goods on the loan, a fancy carriage, a fine jeweled earrings, well, we can translate that as car maybe, and proceeded and surrounded by those bo borrowed goods, he went to the, the marketplace. Then people seeing him would say, Sirs, that is a rich man. That is how the rich enjoy their wealth. Then the owners, whenever they saw him, would take back their things. 
What do you think, householder? What that would that be enough for that man to become dejected? Yes, venerable sir. Why is that? Because the owners took their took back their things. So too, householder, a noble disciple considers thus sensual pleasures have been compared to borrowed goods by the Blessed One. They provide much suffering and much despair, while the danger in them is great. Householder, suppose there were a dense grove not far from some village or town, within which there was a tree laden with fruit, but none of its fruit had fallen to the ground. Then a man came, needing fruit, seeking fruit, wandering in search of fruit, and he entered the grove and saw the tree laden with fruit. Thereupon he thought, This tree is laden with fruit, but none of it has fallen to the ground. I know how to climb a tree, so let me climb this tree. Eat as much fruit as I want, and fill my bag. And he did so. Then a second man came, needing fruit, seeking fruit, wandering in search of fruit. And taking a sharp axe, he, took, he too entered the grove and saw the tree laden with fruit. Thereupon he thought, This tree is laden with fruit, but none of its fruit has fallen to the ground. I do not know how to climb a tree. So let me cut this tree down at its root, eat as much fruit as I want, and fill my bag. And he did so. What do you think, householder? If that first man who had climbed that tree doesn't come down quickly, when that tree falls, wouldn't he break his neck? or his foot, or some other part of his body, so that he might incur death or deadly suffering. Yes, venerable sir, so too, householder, a noble disciple considers thus sensual pleasures have been compared to fruits on a tree by the Blessed One. They provide much suffering and much despair, while the danger is in, in them is still greater. Having seen this thus, as it actually is with proper wisdom, one avoids the equanimity that is diversified, based on diversity, and one develops the equanimity that is unified, based on unity. Where clinging to the material things of the world utterly cease without reminder. And these are quite wonderful images um, that help us reflect in a different way onto how we see happiness. And these trees, these fruits in the trees, we're not the only one that want them. And the more we want them and the more we find gratification in that and we invest our happiness in that, then the more we'll start climbing trees and putting ourselves in all kinds of situations that are precarious, that are not really stable, and that can be cut down at any time at the root. And therefore, that is that happiness that comes from the diversity outside. Now, some spiritual traditions at the time of the Buddha uh, also saw this, but the beauty of the Buddha's teaching is that it differs in the way that the Buddha, yes, did not praise these, this kind of happiness, but it did not stop there. And because we had traditions that were saying you can't, don't, uh, don't indulge in these, these are dangerous, all of these things. But then they didn't offer much else. In fact, they would perform very austere uh, tapas, the austerities of uh, 
practicing uh, uh, very painful uh, austere practices with the body injuring through a lot of pain. And they thought that was going to purge their karma, purge their, uh, uh, their pain, basically. But the Buddha offered an alternative, and not only offered, but that is at the core of the Buddha's awakening also, is that there is another kind of happiness, which is in fact way, way better than this diversity. And the beauty of the Buddha's teaching is that he points to that happiness that comes from samadhi, that comes from mental development, which is supported by the Eightfold Path, which is supported by the virtue, by generosity, by right practice. And with great compassion, seeing that danger in all these things, in wanting more of this and wanting more of that, the mind simply becomes very coarse, very agitated, and then we start clinging and developing very coarse attachment to these things outside. And without seeing it, that's the problem when lacking discernment. That's the definition of lacking discernment, is that we don't see that, because we're engrossed, the mind is engrossed in that very coarse enjoyment. But when we, the Buddha, when we hear the Buddha and we hear him delivering a discourse on the Dhamma and pointing out, be careful, this is not going to help you in the long run, out of great compassion with everything that he went through, everything that he practiced, he points out this, these things, better keep away. But these things, yes, you should indulge. Indulge in generosity, indulge in virtue, indulge in, indulge in the pleasure of meditation. And in fact, once we become the interesting thing about taking our happiness in the meditation and in the goodness, in goodness and in the Buddha's teaching, the Dhamma, is that everything else becomes very happy, becomes very easy, in fact. But this is to be seen by the wise. It is hard to see. It is hard to accept because that chocolate bar is really appealing. <laughs> chocolate bar is a pretty bad example. But, you know watching movies every day, all day, and uh, video games and things like that, you know, um, do not lead to a very uplifted mind that is free from, that is free from hindrances, that is simply happy without indulging in these things. For some people, it's gambling. For some people, it's other things. All kinds of things. There is, this is samsara. But here, he points out the happiness of meditation and the happiness of Nibbana. Here, friend, disengaging from sensory gratification. And see here, that is that wonderful, important step of the first jhana, the first level of meditation, is that we disengage from this. And that is where the Buddha's happiness begins. <laughs> and letting go of unwholesome mental states still attended by thinking and reflection with the blissful happiness born of mental detachment. That is the factor of the first meditation. One understands and abides in the first level of meditation. When one abides meditating in this way, one's awareness and perception becomes invaded and filled with sensory gratification. 
and one feels it as a disturbance. See now how it turned away. Now on the path of meditation, the path of the Buddhist teaching, these things, they are clearly seen as a disturbance. They are seen as a distraction. They bring tension. They agitate the mind to always be engaging in these things. Just as if pain were to arise for one who was happy, that would be known as a disturbance. Similarly, when one's awareness and perception become, become invaded and filled with sensory gratification, one feels it as a disturbance. Now, this, this is just simply sitting with letting go of the tension, smiling, radiating that love or that compassion or the joy, wherever you are. And then at the beginning stages, if you were doing something during the day, this will often leave an impression on the mind and it will come back. We will, we will sit down and like all these things, like conversation will come back or whatever you were doing or you were walking or it will come back to the mind and it will have to be, be let go of because it's a hindrance and that is part of, it's anything that happens at the senses, really. Friend, disturbances have been declared as unpleasant by the awakened one. I think we can all agree with that. By this line of reasoning, friend, it can be understood that Nibbana is happiness. And see here, this is where a very good example where the Buddha, in fact, used the word Nibbana. Well, this is not the Buddha here, but um, it's Venerable Sariputta. Um, but there are other instances where Nibbana is not this ultimate reality all the time. It is, in fact, almost like a verb or an adjective to define the practice, to define the third noble truth, which is the release from these things, from tension. Further, friend, with the calming of thinking and reflection, with inner tranquilization, one's mind becoming unified without thinking or reflection, with the blissful happiness born of mental unity. And see here, this is where that u mental unity starts. When the thinking and the reflection fades away, the mind becomes collected naturally, because there's not much there's nothing to agitate the mind anymore, and it's happy, it's freestanding. When one abides in med meditating in this way, one's awareness and perception becomes invaded and filled with thinking. And one feels it as a disturbance, just as if pain were to arise for one who was happy. That would be known as a disturbance. Friend, disturbances have been declared by the awakened one as unpleasant. By this line of reasoning, friend, it can be understood that Nibbana is happiness. And see here, Nibbana is this gradual quenching, this gradual calming of the mind. It is a practice, a gradual Nibbana. And each of these steps, there is a small Nibbana. And every time we let go of the tension, come back to a wholesome state, with, whether it's one of the resting places of, the, of awareness or it's the Brahma Viharas, every time we let go of tension, of that tiny distraction, that is Nibbana right there. It is a tiny Nibbana, but we accumulate it and we get to the big Nibbana at the end. Further, friend, with the calming of coarser joy, abiding in mental steadiness, present and fully aware, experiencing happiness within one's body, that state which the righteous ones or the awakened ones describe as such, steady presence of mind, this is a pleasant abiding. One understands and abides in the third level of meditation. 
When one abides meditating in this way, one's awareness and perception become invaded and filled with coarser joy. See here, it's never a clean-cut process. It is always moving back and forth. We are letting go of some hindrances. The mind becomes clearer. It experiences deeper sight, deeper insight into these jhanas. It, it becomes more steady. But this is also the direct application of the four awakened understanding in our practice directly with each of the level of meditation, seeing them with discernment and moving towards greater and greater happiness and release. One feels it as a disturbance, just as if pain were to arise for one who was happy, that would be known as a disturbance. In every of these jhanas, when we learn to be established in them, settled in them, we see that this, these previous perceptions that we had, they were a bit coarse, they were a bit troublesome. Therefore, we're inclined to move towards uh, letting them go and move towards greater release. Friend, disturbances have been declared as unpleasant by the awakened one, by this line of reasoning, friend. It can be understood that Nibbana is happiness, quenching out the mind step by step. Further, friend, going beyond happiness and unhappiness, with the settling of mental excitement and sluggishness, with neither pain nor pleasure purified by unmoving presence, one understands and abides in the fourth level of meditation. When one abides meditating in this way, one's awareness and perception become invaded and filled with immovability. Here I change the equanimity for immovability because at this time, it's not just equanimity, but there is still perception of material form or body. And uh, it is a little tricky here uh, to translate this part. It could cause some confusion. And one feels it as a disturbance, just as if a pain were to arise for one who was happy. That would be known as a disturbance. Friend, disturbances have been declared as unpleasant by the awakened one. By this line of reasoning, friend, it can be known that Nibbana is happiness. Further, friend, having entirely gone beyond all perception of form with the awareness of sensory impact falling away, turning away from the awareness of plurality, aware of endless spaciousness. One understands and abides in the plane of endless spaciousness. When one abides meditating in this way, one's, one's awareness and perception become invaded and filled with perception of form. See here, sometimes there might be some grosser awareness of any of the sense doors at this point. But since uh, awareness has become so bright and rid of all of that, these perception of forms, it is only mental or mostly mental. When the mind becomes coarser and feels the body or anything out, outside which is related to any kind of physical form, at this point feels much coarser. When one abides meditating in this way, one's awareness and perception become invaded and filled with perception of form and one feels it as a disturbance. Just as if pain were to arise for one who was happy, that would be known as a disturbance. Friend, disturbances have been declared as unpleasant by the awakened one. By this line of reasoning, friend, it can be understood that Nibbana is happiness. 
Further, friend, having gone entirely beyond the plane of endless spaciousness, aware of endless consciousness, one, enter one understands and abides in the plane of endless consciousness. Now this is where that spaciousness falls away, falls behind, and it becomes... Um, there is, this is the place where we will get to see the process of consciousness very clearly and how it is streaming constantly and that in fact we are not doing this. It is simply streaming. Why? Because of previous karma because of previous mental karma, because of accumulated mental tendencies and habit patterns of the mind, these impressions that have been left on the mind, they condition and they fabricate the consciousness, the stream of consciousness that we think that we are in control of and that we this is me this is mine this is who i am or even think that this consciousness is perhaps even a greater being or something like that well in fact this is where we start to see consciousness at its uh for what it is and that it is simply streaming constantly and it is not um, it is not permanent it is not it is broken up and it starts to break up a little bit later as we will see When one abides meditating in this way, one's awareness and perception become invaded and filled with the awareness of of endless spaciousness and one feels it as a disturbance just as if pain were to arise for one who was happy that would be known as a disturbance friend disturbances have been declared as unpleasant by the awakened one by this line of reasoning friend it can be understood that Nibbana is happiness Further, friend, having entirely gone beyond the plane of endless consciousness, aware of nothing in particular, one understands and abides in the plane of bare awareness. This is simply uh, beyond this consciousness that is continually going. We start noticing that it is this consciousness is coupled it comes with objects it has uh, it's not only just consciousness it has um, a theme it has a thought attached to it it has a concept attached to it and beyond and these concepts and these ideas and these mini themes or these uh, these uh, mental proliferations at that time become uh, less and less because we see that they are coarse and this is where we are cleansing consciousness cleansing our awareness and it becomes a very uh, free awareness as we as we cleanse it as we let go of these coarser proliferations propagations in the mind 
awareness and consciousness starts to detach. It detaches from what? From any kind of uh, subject. Therefore, it becomes bare. It becomes very bare awareness that is not interested in something in particular. It is simply aware. Aware of what? No, nothing in particular. Just aware. And that is a pretty, pretty wonderful state uh, of freedom also. And that's how it should be seen and understood. Further, friend, having... Oh. When one abides meditating in this way, one's awareness and perception become invaded and filled with awareness of endless consciousness. And one feels it as a disturbance. Now sometimes some, the mind will start coupling again or will start uh, conjoining with ideas and thoughts and proliferations again. Because it's the habit, it just arises naturally. It's the habit of the mind. But now we are deconditioning the mind. So uh, whenever that arises, we see that as coarser, as heavier. Just as if pain were to arise for one who is happy, that would be known as a disturbance. Similarly, when one's awareness of and perception become invaded and filled with awareness of endless consciousness, one feels it as a disturbance. Friend, disturbances have been declared by the Blessed One as unpleasant. This is by this line of reasoning, friend, it can be understood that Nibbana is happiness. Further, friend, having entire, entirely gone beyond the plane of bare awareness, one understands and abides in the plane between awareness and its release. This is the limit of awareness. Awareness becomes so subtle and clear and pure that it starts to dissipate, in fact. One, when one abides meditating in this way, one's awareness and perception become invaded and filled with bare awareness. And one feels it as a disturbance. Now, at this place, the Buddha said you can only be aware of this limit of awareness or that plane between the release, between release and between awareness is, is by coming out again out of it. So, uh, we, one might experience a coarser bear awareness again at that point. That means one is back to the a coarser awareness. And uh, that bear awareness will feel even a little heavy uh, for the mind at that time and that full, that place that leans towards more release feels better. And the mind uh, slips into that again and it slowly acquires understanding and confidence in that plane. We can't force this process. It only happens through letting go and at that point it's only relaxing, 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 calming down, calming down, calming down. Not, not attaching any ideas or concept with whatever is happening in the meditation, simply letting it all go and releasing the mind to an even deeper degree. Just as if pain were to arise for one who is happy, that would be known as a disturbance. Friend, disturbances have been declared as unpleasant by the awakened one. By this line of reasoning, friend, it can be understood that Nibbana is happiness. Further, friend, going entirely beyond the plane between awareness and its limit, one understands and abides in the release from experiential awareness. Now that this is called 
well, this is Nibbana, but the ultimate Nibbana, the end goal Nibbana. And having seen with discernment, mental distractions are completely brought to an end. By this line of reasoning, friend, it can be understood that Nibbana is happiness. And one who experiences this invariably has developed discernment to a very sharp degree. And invariably that person is wise to that extent, where has that person has seen the whole process of the mind through each of these stages. And <clears throat> if that per person was not uh, Arya before that, bef was not, did not enter the stream and then acquire full confidence in the Buddha's teaching at that time, uh, or before that time, it probably will at that time. And um, because it sees with wisdom this whole process, the whole of the path that the Buddha taught. And the thing is that once we, once a person has developed discernment to that level, to that sharpness, to that degree, and at this point, it's, it's not possible to not find pleasure or find delight or find happiness with this practice. It's simply not possible. Because just to be able to get there, that means we've understood a long time ago that this was a happy practice. <laughs> and so that this Nibbana is happiness and it's very wonderful. And the thing that happens following after that is compassion. Because this is truly when we, when somebody experiences this, drinks the Dhamma to the, to the depth of the jhanas, to the cessation, and to Nibbana. There is nothing more, there is nothing better that we could wish for others. And it comes for free. And <laughs> we don't need anything to access that. We only need to be wise and to understand how things work and how the mind works and how wholesome and unwholesome states work. And thereby, when a person who is that wise sees another person who hasn't understood that, who, who is still confused, who is still uh, thinking that the, the pleasures of the senses will, will bring lasting, satisfying happiness. Great compassion arises because that person knows and knows and sees the danger in these things that are very ephemeral and volatile and feeds on the healthy happiness of, of the Dhamma. So wisdom and compassion always come together and the deeper we cultivate the path of the Buddha, the greater and the greater and the greater compassion we have because the deeper happiness we taste within ourselves. When someone looks back at their lives and sees, I used to be angry for this, I used to be impatient for this, I used to have so much jealousy for that person, I used to react with this and that, and uh, all the tension, all the misery that was creating in one's life and looks back and sees that these states can no longer arise in that person's mind is quite hard to describe happiness. And a mind that is 
like it is said at the end of the Mangala Sutta, the discourse on the blessing, Puttasa lokadamehi chittangasa na kampati. Touched by all of these things of the world, the mind that is touched by all these worldly things and that remains unshaken, unwavering, that is unaffected, that is standing strong in the Dhamma, in happiness and in goodness, nothing affects that person's happiness. And we thereby that is why the Buddha practiced, he was known to practice every morning waking up, compassion with boundless space. And that is why this practice is traditionally known as, uh, as that, is because uh, the Buddha, uh, from the height of what he understood, he could only feel tremendous compassion for all living beings. Mm -hmm. And so that's why he uh, sat in compassion for one hour in the morning and one hour in the evening or in the night. And so that is the end of this discourse on wisdom and compassion. <laughs> I hope uh, I hope this helped, or that was uh, good. And uh, was there any questions? Okay. Ananda, it's Terence. Yes, hi, Terence. How are you? Can you hear me? Yes. I'm fine, thank you. I just wanted to say thank you for your Dharma talk. Oh. Always appreciated. Such oh. wonderful reminders. Wonderful, wonderful. I'm happy, uh, happy to hear you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm happy to hear from you, Darren. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Good. It's hard to hear you, sorry. Yes, oh, sorry. Maybe I go closer. <laughs> it's okay. It, it's sort of coming and going. Oh, oops. <laughs> <laughs> I saw Terry, maybe. Did you have a question? I saw his... Uh, oh, yes, Marty. Okay. Okay. I'll say that was very good. Um, thank you. Oh, okay, good. Wonderful. Good, good. Bhante, did you say that the Buddha um, was practicing compassion in endless space? Yes. Is that what you said? Thank you, Bhante. Yes. Yes, with a with endless space, because that's its limit. Beyond that. Compassion becomes too coarse to carry, carry on. But uh, um, the Buddha was leaning mostly towards compassion, because in a being that is an arahant, for example, a fully awakened person, what happens is that the four noble truths are locked in. That person cannot see. That person only sees with the Four Noble Truths. It, they're, they're basically the, the blueprint of the mind of an Arahant. They are, um, and therefore, that mind who sees the, the trouble, that sees the cause of the trouble, and sees the release of that trouble constantly in the path, sees how suff how the living beings are behaving and f for a Buddha for example the kind of love or metta that the a Buddha would have is much closer to that very strong compassion 
that we we can experience because of his wisdom <laughs> okay good and thank you buddy mm -hmm. and the when you said in the fourth jhana uh, you mentioned immovability I yes think. yes and I think do you do you mean the um, like the physical body one doesn't really want to engage with it and move it is that what you mean by using the term immovability there yes well it is basically the equanimity of the awakened ones uh, of the aryas that in the third jhana where they speak of that um, this is a pleasant abiding uh, steady awareness steady presence of mind well it is that equanimity that steadiness of mind that is in the fourth jhana in this particular sutta that is the coarser aspect uh, which comes and troubles us but I called it immovability because it's still uh, because to say that equanimity is disturbing is kind of odd I felt <laughs> because that's the opposite of equanimity is disturbance so <laughs> um, so I, I chose to translate it as immovability because it was it at, at that point there is still awareness of form awareness of body so in my understanding that's where I lean towards to uh, Thank you. Okay. Okay. Good. Good. Okay, let's share our merits. And sharing merits is always simply developing a generous open mind to all living beings. So may suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief, and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty powers, share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sad, sad.